Overture. Living in a topsy-turvy world. In his Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel uses the term Die Verkert Welt, usually translated into English as topsy-turvy world, to designate the madness of the social reality of his time. An example of topsy-turvy occurs when your carefully made plans got messed up at the last minute and everyone is running every which way with no idea where to go. One does this sentence from your dictionary. Com entry for topsy-turvy not encapsulate perfectly the basic reversal in a Hegelian dialectical process in the course of which even the best-made projects turn into their opposite, a dream of freedom into terror, morality into hypocrisy, excessive wealth into poverty of the majority? Back in 1576, T. H. Omis Rogers wrote in his A Philosophical Discourse entitled T. H. E. Anatomy of the Mind, devilish it is to destroy a city, but more than devilish to evert cities, to betray countries, to cause servants to kill their masters, parents, their children, children their parents, wives their husbands, and to turn all things topsy-turvy. Th. Re basic relations of domination, masters over servants, parents over children, husbands over wives, are here turned around or, rather, inside out, is this not a succinct formula of Hegel's thought? So, is the present book yet another one on Hegel? In order to explain the logic of denial, Vernianung, Freud evokes a remark made by one of his patients, you ask who that woman in my dream can be. Whoever she is, it's not my mother. Freud's reaction, which has since become proverbial, is, the question is settled then, we can be sure it is indeed his mother. Two, I can say exactly the same about this book of mine, whatever this book is about, it's not about Hegel, and this is not a Freudian denial, but literally true. Yes, Hegel is ever-present in it. Even when he is not directly mentioned he lurks in the background, but the topic of the book is exactly what its title says. 1. Surplus Enjoyment 2. It's about how the paradoxes of surplus enjoyment sustain the topsy-turviness of our time. From Catastrophe to Apocalypse and Back In an ideological space, Different stances get connected into what Ernesto Laclau called a chain of equivalences, for example, extreme right-wing conspiracy theories about the COVID-19 pandemic get combined with New Age spirituality. Melissa Rain Lively's focus on wellness, natural health, organic food, yoga, Ayurvedic healing, meditation, etc., led her into a violent rejection of vaccines as a source of dangerous contamination. 3. Today, this process is palpable all around us. We live in a weird moment where multiple catastrophes, pandemic, global warming, social tensions, the prospect of full digital control over our thinking, compete for primacy, not just quantitatively but also in the sense of which of them will count as the quilting point, Lacan's point de capitan, which totalizes all others. Today, the main candidate in the public discourse is global warming, while lately the antagonism which, in our part of, the world, at least, appears as the crucial one is that between partisans of vaccination and vaccine skeptics. The problem here is that, for COVID skeptics, the main catastrophe today is the fake vision of the pandemic, catastrophe itself which is manipulated by those in power to strengthen social control and economic exploitation. If one takes a closer look at how the struggle against vaccination condenses other struggles, struggle against state control, struggle against science, struggle against corporate economic exploitation, struggle for the defense of our way of life, it becomes clear that this key role of the struggle against vaccination is the outcome of an ideological mystify cation in some aspects even similar to anti-Semitism, in the same way that anti-Semitism is a displaced mystify ed. Form of anti-capitalism, the struggle against vaccination is also a displaced mystify ed form of class struggle against those in power. To fi nd away in this mess, we should perhaps mobilize the distinction between apocalypse and catastrophe, reserving the term catastrophe for what Anders called naked apocalypse. Apocalypse, an uncovering in ancient Greek, is a disclosure or ovicha, living in a topsy turvy world. 3. Revelation of Knowledge In religious speech, what Apocalypse discloses is something hidden, 
the ultimate truth we are blind to in our ordinary lives. Today we commonly refer to any larger-scale catastrophic event or chain of detrimental events to humanity or nature as apocalyptic. Although it is easy to imagine the apocalypse disclosure without the apocalypse catastrophe, say, a religious revelation, and the apocalypse catastrophe without the apocalypse disclosure, say, an earthquake destroying an entire continent, there is an inner link between the two dimensions, when we think that we confront some higher and hitherto hidden truth. This truth is so different from our common opinions that it has to shatter our world, and vice versa, every catastrophic event, even if purely natural, reveals something ignored in our normal existence, places us face to face with an oppressed truth. In his essay Apocalypse Without Kingdom, Anders introduced the concept of naked apocalypse, the apocalypse that consists of mere downfall, which doesn't represent the opening of a new, positive state of affairs, of the kingdom. For Anders's idea was that a nuclear catastrophe would be precisely such a naked apocalypse, no new kingdom will arise out of it, just the obliteration of ourselves and our world. And the question we should ask today is, what kind of apocalypse is announced in the plurality of catastrophes that today pose a threat to all of us? What if apocalypse in the full sense of the term which includes the disclosure of hitherto invisible truth never happens? What if truth is something that is constructed afterwards as an attempt to make sense of the catastrophe? Some would argue that the disintegration of communist regimes in Eastern Europe in 1990 was an authentic apocalypse, it brought out the truth that socialism doesn't work, that liberal democracy is the finally discovered best possible socio-economic system. But this Fukuyama dream of the end of history ended with a rude awakening a decade later, on September 11th, so that we live today in an era that is best characterized as the end of the end, the circle is closed, we passed from catastrophe to apocalypse and then back to catastrophe. We hear again and again that we are at the end of history, but this end just drags on and even brings its own enjoyment. Our usual notion of catastrophe is that it takes place when the intrusion of some brutal event, earthquake, war, ruins the symbolic phi tie-in which is our reality. But, perhaps, there is no less a surplus enjoyment. 4. Catastrophe when reality remains as it is and just the symbolic phi tie-in that sustains our approach to reality dissolves. Let's take the case of sexuality, since nowhere do phi tie-ins play a more crucial role than in sexuality. In an interesting comment on the role of consent in sexual relations, Eva Wiseman refers to a moment in THE Butterful YEFFECT, John Ronson's podcast series about internet porn. On the set of a porn phi LM an actor lost his erection mid-scene, to coax it back, he turned away from the woman, naked below him, grabbed his phone and searched Pornhub. Which struck me as vaguely apocalyptic, note the word apocalypse here. Wiseman concludes, something is rotten in the state of sex. I agree, but I would add the lesson of psychoanalysis, human sexuality is in itself perverted, exposed to sadomasochist reversals and, specify Kali, to the mixture of reality and fantasy. Even when I am alone with my partner, my sexual interaction with him, her is inextricably intertwined with my fantasies, i.e., every sexual interaction is potentially structured like masturbation with a real partner, I use the FLS and body of my partner as a prop to realize slash enact my fantasies. We cannot reduce this gap between the bodily reality of my partner and the universe of fantasies to a distortion opened up by patriarchy and social domination or exploitation, the gap is there from the very beginning. So I quite understand the actor who, in order to regain an erection, searched Pornhub, he was looking for a phantasmatic support for his performance. The rather sad conclusion we are forced to draw from all this is that a catastrophe is not something awaiting us in the future, something that can be avoided with a well-thought-out strategy. Catastrophe in, not only, its most basic ontological sense is something that always already happened, and we, the surviving humans, are what remains, at all levels, even in the most empirical. Sense, do the immense reserves of oil and coal, until now our most important source of energy, 
not bear witness to immense catastrophes that took place on our earth before the rise of humankind? Our normality is by defi nit ion post-apocalyptic. Th is brings us back to our main point, apart from a couple of rational optimists, most of us agree that we, all of us, humanity, are caught in a multiple crisis, pandemic, global warming, social protests. We are entering a new era, and signs that we are doing. Ovacha, living in a topsy-turvy world. 5. So abound. The prospect of a war over access to the waters of the Nile is perhaps a model of wars to come. From the standpoint of nation-state sovereignty, Ethiopia is justify ed in reserving for itself as much as it wants or needs, but if it takes too much of it, this can threaten the very survival of Egypt which is reliant on the Nile. Th air is no abstract solution to this problem, there has to be a negotiated compromise from a global perspective. Now let's jump to a recent act of state terrorism, Belarus forcing a Ryanair plane, which was on its way from Athens to Vilnius, to land in order to get hold of Roman Protasevich, a Belarus dissident. While unambiguously condemning this act of terror, one should remember that Austria did exactly the same thing, landing a FLI crossing its airspace, the plane of the Bolivian president Evo Morales, this was done on the order of the US which suspected Edward Snowden was on that plane trying to get from Russia to Latin America. What do the two events have in common? THEY both exemplify a new type of CONFL ICT which will increasingly characterize our global era, the collision of state sovereignty and the interests of larger communities. Although capitalism nourishes itself from crises, using them to reappear stronger than ever, there is a growing suspicion that this time the well-tested formula will not work. The focus of this book is not different crises as such, but how we fight GHT them or reproduce them, sometimes doing both things in one and the same move. What I try to achieve is not not just to analyze the mess we're in, but simultaneously to de deploy how most of the critiques and protests against global capitalism EFF effectively function as its ideological supplement and do not really question its basic premises. To see how this is possible, one needs to analyze ideology, not as an abstract system of principles but as a material force which structures our actual life. What this further necessitates is that we mobilize the complex apparatus of psychoanalytic theory which brings out the libidinal investments that regulate our daily lives. An unexpected lustwin. We are thereby raising the old Freudian question, why do we enjoy oppression itself? Th ad is to say, power asserts its hold over us not. Surplus enjoyment. 6. Simply by oppression and repression, which are sustained by a fear of punishment, but by bribing us for our obedience and enforced renunciations, what we get in exchange for our obedience and renunciations is a perverted pleasure in renunciation itself, a gain in loss itself. Lacan called this perverted pleasure surplus enjoyment. Surplus enjoyment implies the paradox of a thing which is always, and nothing but, an excess with regard to itself, in its, normal, state, it is nothing. Th is brings us to Lacan's notion of objet as the surplus enjoyment, there is no, basic enjoyment, to which one adds the surplus enjoyment, enjoyment is always a surplus, in excess. Objet A has a long history in Lacan's teaching. It precedes by decades Lacan's systematic references to the analysis of commodities in Marx's capital. But it is undoubtedly this reference to Marx, especially to Marx's notion of surplus value, Merwert, that enabled Lacan to deploy his mature notion of objet as surplus enjoyment, plus de jure, Merlust the predominant motif which permeates all Lacan's references to Marx's analysis of commodities is the structural homology between Marx's surplus value and what Lacan's named surplus enjoyment, the phenomenon Freud calls lustwin, gain of pleasure, which does not designate a simple stepping up of pleasure but the additional pleasure provided by the very formal detours in the subject's EFF or to attain pleasure. Another figure of lustwin is the reversal that characterizes hysteria, Renunciation of pleasure reverts to pleasure of slash in renunciation, 
repression of desire reverts to desire of repression, etc. Such a reversal lies at the very heart of capitalist logic, as Lacan pointed out, modern capitalism began with counting the pleasure, of gaining profit, and this counting of pleasure immediately reverts to the pleasure of counting, profit. In all these cases, gain occurs at a performative level, it is generated by the very performance of working towards a goal, not by reaching the goal. 5. A voluptuous woman from Portugal once told me a wonderful anecdote, when her most recent lover had Phi RST seen her fully naked, he told her that, if she lost just one or two kilos, her body would be perfect. The truth was, of course, that had she lost the weight, she would probably have looked more ordinary, the very element that seems to disturb perfection itself creates the illusion of the overture, living in a topsy-turvy world. 7. Perfection it disturbs, if we take away the excessive element, we lose the perfection itself. So here is the paradox of objet at its purest, there is an attractive but curvaceous woman lacking that something which generates a true charm, what should she do? Not make herself more perfect or beautiful but introduce onto her body some sign of imperfection, some detail disturbing perfection, this additional element may, nothing is guaranteed in this domain. Function as something that disturbs her perfection, so that it creates the mirage of perfection it disturbs. Let's take another, rather tasteless, example, hardcore pornographic movies. My spontaneous intuition tells me that it must be very uncomfortable to perform the ultimate intimate act before a camera very close to me, obeying the director's orders, utter sounds of pleasure or change the positions of bodily parts on demand. Does this not present an obstacle which the performers can overcome only through long training which enables them emotionally to ignore their situation which seems to thwart surrender to ecstatic pleasures? Is sex not something that most of us are able to do only out of view of the public? However, what if we take into account the possibility that, with some people at least, the fact of finding oneself in such a destimulating situation can generate a pleasure of its own. Something along the lines of, it's even more pleasurable to perform the most intimate act as if it is a regulated activity requiring the following of external orders. If, then, every renunciation of pleasure gives birth to a pleasure in this renunciation itself, and if there is no, normal, direct pleasure, so that every pleasure caught in the symbolic cobweb is branded by this perverted twist, is there a way to get out of this vicious cycle of pleasure and pain? The answer Lacan hints at a couple of times is, subjective destitution, a mysterious move of acquiring a distance. From all that forms the wealth of our, inner person, all the shit that is hidden deep in myself, while remaining a subject, a pure, empty subject, a subject who resembles a living dead, a zombie-like subject. What, if anything, does this mean politically? The finale of the book ventures some hypotheses in this direction. However, before arriving at this phi nal point, the book proceeds step by step. It begins with global capitalism as the social form and ultimate source of the madness of our world, focusing on the complex. Surplus enjoyment. 8. Relationship between the Marxist critique of political economy and ecology. From here, it ventures upon what one might call the critique of libidinal economy, the deeply embedded forms of psychic life which sustain social relations of domination and exploitation. THN it deals directly with the basic derangement of our libidinal economy, surplus enjoyment. Finally, the book proposes a way out of this predicament, the radical gesture of subjective destitution. Every chapter is also in some sense a reader's report, each was instigated by an outstanding text. Kohei Saito enabled me to see in a new light the key role of ecology in Marxism, Gabriel Tupanamba shattered my Lacanian complacency with a sharp analysis of the ideological limitations not only of Lacanians but of Lacan himself. Yanis Varoufakis made me aware of how the deadlocks of desire FECT the very core of our political projects, Frank Rudas. Provocative call to abolish freedom brought out the theological roots of emancipatory projects, 
and, last but not least, Saroj Giri instantly converted me to his notion of subjective destitution as a key political category. So where is Hegel in all this? While these authors made visible the failings in our contemporary response to global emergencies, I had some liminal, but maybe important, disagreement with each of them, and, in each case, I found that how reading Hegel can supply that lack. 2 plus A So how does this book deal with the ambiguous signs of the new era? Its formula is 2 plus A, THE PHI RST 2 chapters deal with Marx and Freud, the two founders of modern hermeneutics of suspicion which denounces the visible, socio-political and psychic, order as a theater of shadows regulated by hidden mechanisms, of political economy, of the unconscious Marx analyzed capitalist modernity in which the entire tradition is turned topsy-turvy. Freud deployed the antagonisms and reversals of our psychic lives. In both cases, the aim of my reading is to avoid the reductionist reading of Marx and Freud which claims that they both see social life as determined by objective mechanisms, and to assert the irreducible subjective dimension of social and psychic processes. Overture, Living in a Topsy-Turvy World 9. As with all philosophical works, this book is an ontology of its own, our, in this case, present, so the classics are read from our own historical experience, how do Marx and Freud enable us to grasp our present and its deadlocks? THEY are all rooted in a precise historical constellation, Marx witnessed the unheard of capitalist expansion and analyzed its destructive EFF acts, at the turn of the new century, Freud probed the dark recesses of the human mind against the background of what was called, decline of the West, and the traumatic shock of the Great War. The book reads Marx and Freud from our contemporary standpoint, Marx and ecological crisis, Freud and the sociopolitics of psychoanalysis. Marx and Freud are past classics indispensable for an understanding of our present. But what about our present itself? Th. Eyre is no classical author whose theory would allow us to directly grasp our epoch in its notional structure, we are fully caught in its mess, we are lacking a Cognitive mapping, and the Phi NL chapter plunges directly into this mess. Lacan's notion of objet or surplus enjoyment, modeled upon Marx's surplus enjoyment, was chosen here as a central point of reference because it functions exactly as the operator of topsy turviness. You take a Phi ELD of phenomena, you add to its surplus enjoyment, and the balance of this Phi ELD is irrevocably lost, everything turns around, pain becomes pleasure, lack becomes surplus. Hatred becomes love. Th is chapter is the pivot of the book, and in order not to miss its point the reader must carefully follow the way it gradually approaches its central thesis. Starting with two opposed figures of the big other, the virtual symbolic order, the ID machine, it links the structural inconsistency of the symbolic order to the duality between the symbolic law and the superego, and it then goes on to show how the superego injunction to enjoy regulates the libidinal economy of our permissive societies. The unavoidable result of such permissiveness is depression which can be defined as the suffocation of desire when its object is freely available, what is missing is surplus enjoyment as the object cause of desire. The book's finale then tries to articulate the existential stance which would enable us to break out of the deadlock of permissiveness without regressing into old forms of fundamentalism. Relying on the work of Saroj Giri, I. Surplus Enjoyment 10. Propose a political reading of the Lacanian notion of subjective destitution. Does the book's rootedness in our present imply historicist relativism? The Phi RST move to make here is to radicalize historicism itself. Bruno Latour wrote that it is meaningless to talk about tuberculosis in medieval times, tuberculosis is a modern cyanified C category which has no place in the medieval horizon of thought, if we were to meet a man from that era and tell him, your brother died of tuberculosis, this would have meant nothing to him. The further step is that modernity, which, for Latour, doesn't exist, not only introduces a new horizon of understanding, it changes the entire Phi ELD and also redefines what appears to us as medieval era, 
our notion of the medieval era is rooted in our epoch, it is always already mediated by our contemporary experience. We cannot ever occupy a neutral place exempted from history from which we could compare different epochs. So, again, does this mean that we cannot escape the trap of historicism? The way out of the historicist deadlock is indicated by the well-known passage from Grundris, where Marx deploys apropos the notion of labor how universal notions, although universal, eternal, transhistorical, valid for all epochs, appear as such, become actual, part of our experience, only in a particular epoch. We don't reach universality by abstracting from concrete features of particular epochs but by focusing on a particular epoch in which the universality in question appears as such, this point is for Hegel the point of concrete universality. The hypothesis of this book is that the same holds for the topsy-turviness of human history, although universal, it becomes part of our daily experience only in our epoch, the epoch after, the end of history in 1990 when new, post-historical, antagonisms exploded. Today, the predominant idea of interpreting Hegel is that, in order to be of any use, Hegel should be read through some post. Hegelian theory. Liberal readers of Hegel, like Robert Brandom, who focus on mutual recognition submit him to pragmatic linguistic reading. For eco-Marxists, like Saito, Hegel's notion of the self-movement of idea should be reinterpreted as the collective productive process of humanity rooted in nature. Psychoanalysts who refer to Hegel, like Lacan, see in Hegel's dialectic a distorted overture, living in a topsy-turvy world. 11. Expression of the processes of the unconscious and its reintegration by the self. The ongoing ideological-political mess, populist violence that comes close to civil war, cannot be explained just by vested economic interests and ideological manipulations, one has to introduce, racist, sexist, enjoyment clearly discernible in alt-right carnivalesque public events. In each of these cases, the book will argue that there is more in Hegel than in his contemporary critical readings, Hegel's notion of nature is more open to contingencies than the Marxist focus on the productive process, instead of reading Hegel through Freud, one should read Freud, as well as Lacan, in a Hegelian way to detect his fateful limitations. Finally, far from simply dismissing religion as a finite way to represent conceptual truth, Hegel clearly saw the role of surplus enjoyment in religious collective rituals, the satisfaction they bring. So, again, the target of my critique is the already. Mention predominant stance according to which we can retrieve what is alive in Hegel, as well as Marx and Freud, only if we read him through some later figure of orientation, Freud through Lacan, Marx through today's ecological problems, and Hegel himself through the liberal theory of mutual recognition. But what if the opposite move is also necessary, we have to read Hegel through later events and thoughts and then return back to Hegel to grasp what these new events and thoughts are really about. What if those who read Hegel's notion of freedom through the lenses of the gradual progress towards free mutual recognition miss radical negativity as the core of a dialectical process? 6. What if we can properly grasp the deadlocks of Marxism and ecology only if we read Marx through Hegel? What if we can grasp the radical break in Freud and Lacan only if we read them through Hegel? So let's conclude with a Hegelian welcome to our viral time, all. Big battles today, at the beginning of the 25 RST century, are Battles of viruses Spirit is a virus parasitizing on the human animal, and this parasitizing got more dangerous with the prospect of a wired brain where our mental processes will be directly controlled by the big other of a global digital network. Biochemical viruses threaten our survival, COVID-19 will for sure be followed by other and probably worse epidemics. And, last but not least, global capital itself is a gigantic virus which ruthlessly uses us as surplus enjoyment. 12. Means of its expanded self-reproduction. Yes, this century will be Hegelian. Good luck, Mr. Hegel. According to a legend, 
probably no more than that, the Phi RST words pronounced by Neil Armstrong after making the Phi RST step on the moon on July 20, 1969 were not the OFFI Siley reported th at one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind but the enigmatic remark, good luck, Mr. Gorski. Many people at NASA thought it was a casual remark concerning some rival Soviet cosmonaut. We had to wait until July 5, 1995 when, while answering questions following a speech, Enigma was explained, in 1938, when he was a kid in a small Midwestern town, he was playing baseball with a friend in the backyard. His friend hit the ball, which landed in his neighbor's yard by their bedroom window. His neighbors were Mr. and Mrs. Gorski. As he leaned down to pick up the ball, young Armstrong heard Mrs. Gorski shouting at Mr. Gorski, Sex. You want sex. You'll get sex when the kid next door walks on the moon. 7th is is what literally happened 31 years later. Upon hearing this anecdote, I imagined my own version. What if around 1800, when Hegel was still little known, some old, and now forgotten, professor was heard to shout at him, fame. You want to be a famous philosophical classic. You'll get fame when a guy from some little-known small Slavic country like Slovenia writes a big fat book about you which will be translated into many other languages. Th is is what happened when my over, 1000 page less th and nothing appeared, although there is no doubt that some enemy of mine would immediately add, th's book may be a giant leap for ziz ek, but it is a small step for philosophy. Among those enemies was Deffy Knightley Roger Scruton, who wrote some years ago, indeed, if there were no greater reason to regret the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, the release of ziz ek on the world of Western scholarship would perhaps already be a suffy scient one. 8. One should stop for a moment to ponder the madness of this claim, even if one takes into account the moment of rhetorical exaggeration that I am more dangerous and overture, living in a topsy-turvy world. 13. Destructive than all the horrors of communist totalitarianism. Incidentally, similar claims abounded in the 1990s, when Western conservatives were reminded that communism was undermined by pop culture and sexual revolution much more than by traditional values, some of them snapped back that this fact alone made one regret the collapse of communist regimes. One can imagine how this accusation feeds my megalomaniac fantasies. Hegel wrote that the spiritual result of the Peloponnesian War is the book Th. Eusidides wrote on it, thousands had to die so that a book was written, in a similar way, the spiritual result of communism with its breathtaking terror is my release on Western scholarship. The whole of Eastern Europe had to go through dangerous turmoil so that I could become known in Western academia. If we step out of this megalomaniac madness, there is a hint of what the role of an intellectual is today. When a system that deserves to disappear, like Soviet communism, EFF effectively disintegrates, and, almost, everybody is enthusiastic about its fall, the task of thought, our task today, is to envisage the dangerous potentials of the emerging new order. Again, one should practice a critique of critique and avoid at any cost the smug satisfaction of just kicking the head of a system which already lies dead in front of us. Th adds why today, in the mess of alt-right obscenities and pseudo-leftist PC moralist rigidity, moderate conservatives are often the only reasonable partners of, what remains of, the radical left. In a recent phone conversation with an editor of Die Welt, the moderately conservative German daily, I expressed my amazement that they were prepared to publish me, a self-declared moderately conservative communist. The wonderful answer I got was that I shouldn't be so surprised since they are a moderately communist conservative newspaper. Th air is, however, a feature of this book which will annoy many readers, even some of those otherwise sympathetic to my ideas, the style gets crazier and crazier, so that the book itself can appear as a gradual drift into madness. While the Phi RST chapter could still pass as an academic treatise, the text more and more reads as a confused jumping from one example to another, from one quotation or image to another. Incidentally, 
the same accusation befell Hegel in the Phi RST reactions to his phenomenology of spirit. My answer is that, while I plead guilty to this reproach, I consider it a positive feature, a surplus enjoyment. 14. Strategy that is essential in unraveling the antagonisms of a text as well as of a historical epoch. T. H. Arrain resides the fatal limitation of the EFF or to faithfully reconstruct the meaning intended by the author from whom we quote, what if the interpreted slash quoted author is him slash herself inconsistent, caught in historical antagonisms and tensions, so that the real violence is a reading which obfuscates these antagonisms. In this sense, I plead for, and practice, a violent reading, a reading which tears, what appears as, organic unities apart and the passages it quotes out of their context, establishing new unexpected links between fragments. THSA links do not operate at the level of continuous linear historical progress, they rather emerge at points of, dialectic at a standstill, Benjamin, in which a present moment, in a kind of transhistorical short circuit, directly echoes homologous moments in the past, in short, I try to. Practice what, in politically read, Eduardo Cadeva and Sara Nadal. Melcio 9 have developed as a materialist practice of engaged reading, a reading which is in its very linguistic form political. Such a reading breaks out of the space of the standard opposition between the imminent reading, which tries to remain faithful to the interpreted text, and the practice of quotation which just uses fragments of a text to justify present ideological and political measures. The exemplary case of such practice is found in Stalinism, the key to Leninism as, Stalinist, ideology is provided by Mikhail Suslov, the member of the Politburo responsible for ideology from Stalin's late years to Gorbachev. Neither Khrushchev nor Brezhnev would release any document until Suslov had looked over it. Why? Suslov had an enormous library of Lenin's quotes in his Kremlin OFFICE, they were written on library cards, organized by themes, and contained in wooden Phi Ling cabinets. Every time a new political campaign, economic measure, or international policy was introduced, Suslov found an appropriate quote from Lenin to support it. Lenin's quotes in Suslov's collection were isolated from their original contexts. Because Lenin was an extremely prolified sea writer who commented on all sorts of historical situations and political developments, Suslov could find and the appropriate quotes to legitimate as Leninist almost any argument or initiative, sometimes even if they opposed each other, the very same quotes from the founders of Marxism Leninism that Suslov successfully. Ovacha, living in a topsy turvy world. 15. Used under Stalin and for which Stalin so highly valued him, Suslov later employed to critique Stalin. 10 th is was the truth of Soviet Leninism, Lenin served as the ultimate reference, a quote of his legitimized any political, economic or cultural measure, but in a totally pragmatic and arbitrary way, in exactly the same way, incidentally, that the Catholic Church referred to the Bible. The irony is thus that the two big orientations of Marxism, the Stalinist one and the authentic one, can be perfectly grasped through two different modes of quotation. What Benjamin conceptualized and practiced, together with Hegel, Marx, Lenin, Brecht, Jameson, and numerous others, was a radically different practice of quotation, quotation as a form of struggle with the quoted text as well as with the writer's own predicament. Materialist quotation is internal to the quoted original through its very externality to it its violent disfiguration of the original is in some sense more faithful to the original than the original itself since it echoes social struggles that traverse both. 11 th adds why I jump from Hegel to Hollywood comedies, from Kant to vampires and the living dead in pop culture, from LGBT plus to Slovene vulgar expressions, from revolutionary subjectivity to Joker with the hope that, in these crazy combinations, I, sometimes, at least, succeed in doing what Benjamin intended. So this book is definitely a guide for the non-perplexed, it does not try to clarify things for the perplexed, it tries to perplex the non-perplexed who comfortably swim in the water of everyday ideology, not only trying to perplex them but demonstrating that their newly gained perplexity resides already in the thing itself.
In the same vein, this book Defy Knightly does not provide a safe space for those exposed to racism and sexism. In a recent incident that occurred at the University of Alberta, Kathleen Lowry, a professor at the School of Anthropology, was under threat of losing her job for claiming sex is not just a cultural construct but primarily biological fact. Technically she was Phi read from her position as Associate Chair of Undergraduate Programs in the Department of Anthropology for creating an unsafe environment for students, how? In a nutshell, she doesn't believe that sex is a social construct. 12. To clarify things, one should add here that the opposition between biological fact and symbolic construct is not an exhaustive one, there is a third. Surplus enjoyment. 16. Option, sexual difference itself as real slash impossible which is not a biological fact but a traumatic cut slash antagonism that cannot be fully symbolized. But what should draw our attention is the word, unsafe, unsafe, ultimately amounts to something that threatens the, self-declared, victim's views and self-perception. Let's take the case of a man who transforms into a woman, if gender identity is, also, biologically determined, this in no way limits his, her freedom to change gender identity. What it threatens is his, her idea that his slash her identity is a purely cultural construct that ultimately depends on his, her free decision, the idea that I can freely reconstruct myself, play with multiple identities, and that all obstacles to this plasticity are to be located in cultural oppression. One cannot but note how, in the case of sexual identities, the passage from one to another identity, like cross-dressing, is hailed as progressive, as undermining binary logic, while in the case of racial identities, transitions, especially whites dressing as blacks, are rejected as racial appropriation, as a form of racism. Here is a recent case, Bright Sheng is a world-class composer who has been teaching at the University of Michigan since 1995. On September 10, 2021, David Gere, the dean of the University of Michigan School of Music, T.H. Eater and Dance, announced that Sheng would stop teaching his undergraduate music composition course. The decision came a month after Sheng screened for the class the 1965 movie adaptation of Shakespeare's Othello featuring Laurence Olivier playing Othello with black makeup. Sheng was turned in, according to the Michigan Daily, by one of his freshman students, Olivia Cook, who took note that Olivier was playing Othello in black makeup. She wrote, in such a school that preaches diversity and making sure that they understand the history of POC, people of color, in America, I was shocked that, Sheng, would show something like this in something that's supposed to be a safe space. In a statement to the Michigan Daily, composition professor Evan Chambers, who is replacing Sheng on the course, wrote, to show the Phi LM now, especially without substantial framing, content advisory and a focus on its inherent racism, is in itself a racist act, regardless of the professor's intentions. 13 The same was done in the Soviet Union around 1970 when the BBC production of The Forsyth Saga, 1967, was shown on TV, to Ovacha, living in a topsy-turvy world. 17. Prevent ideological contamination, each episode was introduced by a 5 e to 10-minute commentary by a Soviet literary scientist who provided substantial framing and content advisory, warning viewers of how, in spite of its universal humanism and occasional critical stance, the series celebrates the bourgeois way of life. And, to go even further back, until a century or so ago, it was prohibited in Catholic countries for children, and in some cases even for adults, to read the Bible directly, without a proper comment providing substantial framing and content advisory, since, without such a comment, many passages could incite impure or cruel thoughts. Just think about the story of David and Bathsheba. It is sad to see this tradition resuscitated today on behalf of political correctness. In the case of Othello, to impose these conditions, substantial framing, content advisory in a Focus on its inherent racism, on showing the Phi LM EFF effectively is in 
itself a racist act, regardless of Chambers's intentions, he treats viewers in an extremely patronizing way, as naive creatures who have to be protected from the direct impact of the text. Upon a closer look, one can easily see that this is a double protection, by watching a movie like Othello, whites are reassured in their racism, blacks are not so much seduced into racism which humiliates them as insulted and furious at how racism goes on in culture, and their daily lives. But here problems begin. Othello off-airs a safe space for white racists, assuring them that even in an OFFI sily non-racist culture their privileges are safe, it violates campus as a safe space for blacks who are plagued even there by racism in high culture. But does the proposed strategy, substantial framing, content advisory and a focus on its inherent racism, work? No, because proper insults which F.E.C.T. the victim are impervious to negation, no matter how many qualified cations are. Added, the insult remains an insult, this is why, among others, the N-word is prohibited and cannot be used, no matter how many qualified cations we add. But direct prohibition of all works that may be perceived by someone as insults is also counterproductive, it cannot but generate an immense apparatus of censorship which would ultimately not only impoverish the presumed victims themselves but also open up the space for cynical irony that would even further insult the victims. The problem resides in the very surplus enjoyment. 18. Concept of academia as a safe space, we should find GHT to render the world outside academia safe for all, and if academia wants to contribute to this Phi GHT, it should be precisely the space where we openly confront all racist and sexist horrors. TH is book for sure does that. 1. Where is the rift? Marx, Capitalism, 